Good morning, church. Good morning, balcony. How are you? Well, it is, uh, it's good to be here. As, uh, as Pastor Bill mentioned in the announcement time, it, uh, it has been a very busy weekend, and I find myself this morning to be very thankful for the gift of, uh, of a multi-staff church, a gift of plurality of leadership. On uh, Friday afternoon, I, I sent an email to uh, Pastor Bill and Pastor Evan and said, I'm going to need to pull the emergency brake and on uh, my life and pull out until Sunday morning because we had a couple sick kids at home and a wife that wasn't feeling too good either and uh, it was so good to know that everything was well in hand things probably go better when I'm not around anyway and so very very thankful uh, for all that's going on here I want to invite you to open your Bibles uh, to Matthew 19 1 to 12 that's on page 824 if you're using the pew Bible in front of you there uh, we're carrying on this morning with our series called Family Matters, and we're talking today about something, I'll be honest with you, I have never preached on before in my life, and I've never heard a sermon on before in all my life, and it is the topic of singleness and celibacy. Now, there are two uh, principal passages that you would go to in the New Testament if you wanted to preach on this topic. Uh, you'd look at Matthew 19, 1 to 12, which we're going to do this morning, and also 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, 1 to 12, but then also uh, several other paragraphs within that rather lengthy chapter. Now, the, the two passages that I've mentioned are remarkably similar in terms of what they teach. There's great continuity between what Paul says and what Jesus says, which you would expect. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to read the one passage, the Matthew 19 passage in full, and then we'll refer to the 1 Corinthians 7 passage on kind of an as-needed basis. And my plan for this morning is to read the text. These will be unfamiliar texts, I think, to us. Like I said, I've, I've certainly read these texts before many times, you know, multiple times a year if you're doing the RMM Bible reading plan, but I've never heard them taught through. And so we will do that. We'll take a look at, at these passages. We'll look at what the Bible has to say. And then we'll answer the question, or we'll try to answer the question, why would God give someone the gift of celibacy? And then will ask how we as a church can serve and support single and celibate people in our midst. So hear now the word of the Lord, beginning at verse 1 of Matthew 19. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's begin then with what this text and what the Bible says about marriage, singleness, and celibacy. Now, I framed the question that way because that is the way that the Bible frames the question. In both of the principal passages that we referred to uh, in the opening there, in both of those passages, celibacy and singleness are only discussed within the context of a larger discussion of marriage. So we need to look at that. And when we look at those passages, we see that marriage is a repeated and protected norm in the New Testament. So by repeated, I mean that we don't get a new teaching on marriage in the New Testament. When the Pharisees come and they ask Jesus about some issues related to marriage, he doesn't give a new teaching. 
And it's not like Jesus couldn't give a new teaching. In our, in our Gospel of Mark series, we've seen many times that actually people were continually astonished that Jesus gave new teachings. Jesus had the authority to address things that were not otherwise addressed in the Word of God. Jesus had the authority to clarify what was being misunderstood. Jesus doesn't give any new teaching here. Jesus gives and he repeats the teaching of the Bible on marriage from Genesis 1 and 2. That's hugely significant. There, there's no new sexual morality in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus doesn't uh, lighten things up. In fact, if anything, in the New Testament, you find things narrowed down and tightened up, right? Jesus says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, that is, do not have sex with your neighbor's wife. Okay, well, Jesus says, let's not be content with that. That's a pretty low bar. Let's, he says, I'm telling you, don't even look at your neighbor's wife with lust in your heart, right? That's a much higher standard. We We don't have a loosening standard of of sexual morality in the New Testament. We have a repetition of the foundational standard that we meet in the Old Testament. And if anything, we have clarification and we have, we have narrowing. Jesus adopts, repeats, and affirms the Old Testament teaching on marriage. He says that marriage is between one man and one woman. He says that it is a one flesh union. That is, it is a sexual and it is a total union of people for life indissoluble. What God has joined together, let man not separate. So let's state the obvious. Jesus was unapologetically pro-marriage. He did his first miracle at a wedding. Many of his parables are actually set in the context of a wedding. Jesus frequently referred to himself as the bridegroom and as the church, as the bride. And in fact, the Bible says that when Jesus returns for the church, we will all sit together and enjoy the wedding supper of the Lamb. So again, let's state the obvious. Jesus is unapologetically pro-marriage. The Apostle Paul is also pro-marriage. In 1 Corinthians 7, he is answering a question about the supposed superiority of the celibate lifestyle. Now, this is one of the reasons why 1 Corinthians 7 is a very hard chapter to deal with. There are a couple of reasons why 1 Corinthians 7 always confuses us as Bible readers. One of them is that Paul is responding to questions that have come to him. He says that right in the letter. He says that they have written to him with some questions. And then Paul is responding. So he repeats the question, and you'll see that in the citation that we'll look at in just a minute. That's one of the reasons that 1 Corinthians 7 is hard to figure out, because you've got to figure out what's the question and what's the answer. But the other reason that 1 Corinthians 7 can be hard for us to understand is because they are coming at this issue from the ditch on the other side. When you read the Bible, you have to first try to get out of your own cultural headspace, your own cultural assumptions, and you have to get into the first century context, and you have to ask, what's going on there that caused this teaching to be given? And we have a hard time with this, because in our culture, because we're sex-obsessed and we're relationship-obsessed, we can't imagine that there would ever have been a time when celibacy looked like a really good option to a lot of people. But in fact, in the ancient world, there was a pre-existing tradition of celibacy. There was, there was a thread within Greek philosophy that, that upheld and that glorified the, the single celibate lifestyle. So there was a cultural context. But then again, in the early church, you had the figure of Jesus, who was himself single and celibate. You had John the Baptist. You had the Apostle Paul. And so people are actually starting to wonder, is celibacy the highest and best expression of Christian life? Should we all be celibate? And, and by the way, here's a quick tip for you. If you ever find yourself asking a question that if everyone answered the way you're suggesting they might, it would result in the end of the species, you're barking up the wrong tree. But, but nevertheless, that was literally the, the question they're asking. And you can see that. Paul quotes their question, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. He says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's the question they wrote to him and asked. So people were writing to Paul, saying, Brother Paul, I was a married man when I came to Christ, but I, I see now that Jesus was celibate, 
I see John the Baptist was celibate. I see that you're celibate. And so what I'm asking is, should I also be celibate and live with my wife basically as brothers and sisters in the Lord? That was the question. And this is Paul's answer. No, right? He gets into uncomfortable levels of detail in verses 3 to 4. He says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Let's just pause here. Sometimes, this is sort of an, uh, I'm going to call this an excursus comment. Sometimes folks will say that the sexual ethic of the Bible is repressive and regressive. Well, I would say it depends on where you're standing in history. Do you know that this is actually considered by scholars, meaning people who study the actual ancient world out of which the, 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 into which the Bible comes, no one in human history had ever said anything like what the Apostle Paul says. In, in Roman culture, a woman had to give to her husband sexual privileges, sexual rights. Nowhere was it ever said that the man had to give to his wife her sexual rights. The Bible treats the husband and wife as sexual equals in a marriage. No one had ever done that before. Paul goes on to say, we're not going to get to it in the brief citation that we have, but he, but he says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Again, that's, that's not interesting. Everybody in the Roman world said that. But then he flips it and he says, and likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. No one had ever said that in the ancient world, ever. It's a remarkable, remarkable statement. Paul says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For, oh, I, we are going to read it. Though the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That's a remarkable statement. And so Paul's general advice is for husbands and wives to give themselves to each other, to serve each other generously with their bodies. Paul speaks very positively about sex, he speaks very positively about marriage, and he speaks very negatively about anyone who teaches otherwise. Listen to what he says in 1 Timothy 4. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. So he says, Be aware of this, church. Folks will come and stand in the church and teach, but understand, they're not teaching by the Holy Spirit, they're filled with a demon. What are those people going to say? Well, they're going to be insincere liars whose consciences are seared, and they're going to forbid marriage. And they're we're going to require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So Paul says, if anyone ever stands up in your church and says a bad word about marriage, understand this, that person's filled with a demon. That's, that's what I meant when I said, this is a protected doctrine. That's a pretty high fence, right? Like as pastors are thinking about, what am I going to preach this Sunday? You look for verses that say, if you preach that, everyone will know you're filled with a demon. And you avoid those. <laughs> right? Like this is a protected doctrine. So Paul is pro-marriage. Let's put that on the table. He says that marriage is a gift from God to us for our good. Thanks be to God. But both Paul and Jesus go on from that place to speak about another gift that is also from God and that is also for our good. The Bible says that celibacy is a commendable exception. Now, I've chosen those words carefully. Celibacy is a commendable exception to the general rule of marriage. A commendable exception. You'll notice that the Bible doesn't say, you know, hey, listen, if you're single and God obviously has to throw you a bone and gives you the gift of celibacy so you can survive that, there's no need to be embarrassed about that, okay? That's not a sin, per se, right? That's not how the Bible discusses celibacy. It's not, it's not embarrassing. It's not something to be regretted. It is spoken of as a commendable exception. It's a, it's a good thing. Look at what Paul says. He says, this is verse 7, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind, one of another. So Paul says marriage is a gift, and celibacy is a gift. But Paul says, I really like my gift, and I actually wish that more folks had it. I heartily commend it to you. Now that's hard for us to get our heads around, 
I remember this was one of the things I struggled to, to get as a Bible reader. Like, as a, as a young Bible reader, as a young sort of student going out into ministry, you tend to preach your first 50 sermons on stuff you've figured out, right? And as a young guy coming out of seminary, I think, I don't even know if I had 50 things figured out, but you sort of stick to those real safe topics, you know? Murder is bad, sermon one. I have that down. There's no ambiguity in my heart on that. And then you save all the real complicated ones for like if anyone's stupid enough to have you in their employ for 11 years, uh, right? Then, then you pull out the, okay, time to talk about celibacy and singleness. And, and I remember having a hard time wrapping my head around what 1 Corinthians 7 is saying about singleness and celibacy. Because our mind, and it's not because it's complicated in the text, it's because our minds have a hard time, our Western minds have a hard time of seeing what's there. We think in binary terms, right? So we think something is good or bad. If, a good, if something is good, then its opposite is bad, right? Like how hard is this to figure out? If dogs are good, cats are bad. Everybody knows that. Right? It's not rocket science. And, and so it would just be easier for my mind, and I suspect for your mind, if what the Bible said is marriage is good, celibacy is bad. Or celibacy is good, marriage is bad. I can wrap my head around that. But what the Bible says is that marriage is good and celibacy is good. They're both gifts from God. Jesus said the same thing. After affirming the standard biblical affirmation of, of marriage, he goes on to say, there are eunuchs who have, made, who have been so from birth, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Now he's using the word eunuch there in a metaphorical sense, as in the unmarried person the person who's not living a sexual life. He's saying that those, there, there are people who are unmarried for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Good, he says. That's a good thing. Let the one who is able to receive that, receive it. Don't despise that gift from God. If God gives you the gift of celibacy, then receive it as grace from his hand. So marriage is a gift, and celibacy is a gift. That's important, because some of us feel like celibacy is a punishment. Some of us feel that singleness is a punishment. But it's not. Celibacy is a gift. Marriage is a gift. Now, marriage is a gift that may be given more frequently than celibacy, but both should be received gladly as gifts from the hand of the Lord. Now that's the perspective and the attitude of the scriptures. And that leads us to our second question. Why then might God give the gift of celibacy to a particular person? I think there are a couple of answers to that that we can see in the text. The first one is the most obvious one, to serve the church in a particular and focused way. That's the, the answer that Jesus points to in Matthew 19. He, he says, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that you can do more for the cause of Christ as a single person than you could as a married person. There's just no doubt of that. The, the Apostle Paul says that too. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 34, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Paul says it's simple math. If you're a married man, then you need to spend a certain number of your waking hours thinking about and caring for your wife. That's not optional. I mean, Paul commands that. He commands husbands. He says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's not something that you can delegate to your secretary. That's something you need to take care of. Right? And it will take time. It will take considerable time and effort. And that time and effort has to come off the total that is then available 
for the wider cause of Christ. And that's not a problem. That's not something to be regretted or resented. That's just math. The single person can give more time and attention to the cause of Christ. The single man or the single woman. And let's state the obvious. The church has been remarkably blessed by gifted and committed single and celibate people. The, the mission field has been dominated by single and celibate people, men and women. J quick example of this. Do you know that our team that's going out later this month, I think they're leaving in 11 days. Somebody told me this morning, it's like 11 days or something like that, that our team to India, they're leaving. Do you know that three out of the six members of that team are single people? Did you know that? And, and if you think about it, you would expect that. Be because it, going to India is not something you do on a weekend, right? It takes three days to get on site in India. Uh, when Andrew and I used to, or I've gone a number of times, I think six times, uh, to India, and some of the places that we go to, it's multiple flights, it's, you know, weaving your way through hordes of donkeys, like, or not donkeys, goats and sheep, what other kind of animals, they're everywhere, and it is a, it is just a trip back in time and over tremendous distance, and it, it takes the better part of three days, and so it's three days there, it's three days back, you got to be on site if you're going to travel that much for a couple of weeks, uh, we've done trips that are 21 days to India, well that's an awful long time to leave your wife or your husband at home with, with the kids, that's an, that's an awful long time to, you know, have kids be without mom or dad. And so, obviously, and if you think back further in time, I mean, we complain about three days to India. You know, our great-grandparents, when they went to India, it was six months. Did you know that? Like, when our great-grandparents, uh, and I, I say to India, just not hypothetically, Baptists have been involved in India from, from the very beginning. Uh, William Carey, yeah, Adoniram Johnson, uh, Judson went to India, but then actually went over to Rangoon. Uh, it was a six-month journey. Six months there, six months out. And when you think of some of the stories, like the story of Adoniram Judson, I don't know if you're familiar with that story. Adoniram Judson went out, went to India, then was redirected to Rangoon across the Bay of Bengal. He buried several of his children and two wives in Rangoon because of their exposure to tropical diseases that their body simply could not fight off. The price of missions in the era of our grandparents was absolutely remarkable. And so there's no wonder that the majority of that work was done by single people. Because single people can do things that would be very, very hard for married people to attempt. Now, Paul mentions another reason why God might give a person the gift of celibacy. The second reason he, he mentions is it might be given to help a person survive an immediate or imminent crisis. So that's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 7. So in 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 31, he has a section there of counsel for engaged or betrothed people. And in that section, he, in, he advises a temporary freeze on all marriages, all marital decisions. He says in verse 26, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Meaning, if you're engaged, don't break the engagement. But if you're single, don't seek to, to be engaged. Let's just pause for now and see how this turns out. And then at the end of the section, verse 31, he says, for the present form of this world is passing away. The kingdom of God was was pressing in, was, was being born into the world in the Apostle Paul's day, and he anticipated that that would result in a great deal of upheaval and chaos, and of course it did. The whole Jewish world was thrown into absolute crisis. The, the burning question, of course, was would Judaism embrace Jesus Christ as their Messiah or reject him? In fact, the inner turmoil of the Jewish community was so severe that they were kicked out of Rome en masse in A.D. 50, right around A.D. 50, under Claudius. 
And then subsequent turmoils were, again, so, uh, so they were so agitated and so uh, in, in, a, in a, a turmoil about this question that in A.D. 69-70, the entire country revolted. There was a huge revolt. The Romans pressed down that revolt, destroyed Jerusalem. It, it was considered by many historians to be the most brutal episode in Roman history. Now, by the way, in the Old Testament, there's a very similar story. Just before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and, and scattered the people of God, in that day, God told the prophet Jeremiah not, not to get married. I don't know if you remember that. He said in Jeremiah chapter 16, he said, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning the mothers who bore them, and the fathers who fathered them in this land, they shall die of deadly diseases, they shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground, they shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth." Siege warfare and the destruction of a city and the massacre of its people is considered the most brutal thing that can, that can happen. It's, siege warfare is, is inhumane. Uh, they cut off all food and, and water. People starve to death. They become so emaciated they actually become crazy. There are documented reports of mothers eating the bodies of their dead children. It's absolutely horrific. What is mind-boggling is that it happened to the Jewish people almost identically in identical ways twice over the course of their history. First by the Babylonians, then by the Romans. And just prior to both of those horrific events, the Bible specifically commands people to consider not marrying. It's interesting to take note of. Old Testament and New Testament, there are, there are just times when it is better not to be a husband and a father. It's better not to be a wife and a mother. Paul says, in, in view of these massive upheavals that we're, we're just coming up on, it might be wiser and kinder to hold off until we see how things shake out. Now, of course, this can apply to geopolitical storms. This can apply to eschatological storms, great upheavals in the purpose of God. But I think it can also apply on a personal level. God may be taking you through a salvation and sanctification storm at a certain point in your life. And it might be better to hold off on marriage contracts, getting engaged and getting married until you have passed through those particular storms, which means that sometimes the gift of celibacy comes with an expiration date. It's not forever, but it is for a particular storm. Thirdly and lastly, God also may give the gift of celibacy to a person in order to show the world what a human being really is and is not. We live in a world where people define themselves primarily by their work and by their relationships. And you know that if you've ever been to a party. When you go to a party and you meet someone, what's the first question they ask you? What do you do for a living? And what's the second question that they ask you? Are you married? And do you have kids? Right? And then what do you talk about for the next 20 minutes? You show them pictures of your kids and your wife and your... your that, that you, you introduce yourself according to your work and relationships. And that is one of the reasons why it is so hard to be a single person in our culture. Now, all of us contribute to this value system without even realizing it. When a woman dies in a car accident, what do we say? We say, oh my goodness, what a tragedy. She had two kids. But how does a single person in our midst hear that sentence? They hear it as suggesting that the death of a single person would be less of a tragedy. They hear that as affirming the idea that if you don't have relationships, then you have less worth as a person. And of course, even the insurance companies and the courts play into this. You get a larger settlement if you had kids. You get a larger settlement if you left behind a husband or a wife. But what does the Bible say about the worth of a human being? How does the, how does the Bible attribute value to a human life? We see it clearly in Genesis 9, 6. 
The Bible says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. The Bible says that we assign the maximum penalty to murder because the life of every human being has maximum value because it has been created in the image and likeness of God. So listen, if you're a single person, you need to understand this, that according to the Bible, you have maximal value simply because you are created in the image and likeness of God. Before you enter into a relationship, before you do any work, you have maximal value as a person created in the image of likeness of God. Now here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that human life is ultimately about one relationship over and above all others. The Bible says that you were made by God and for God. And that relationship is what gives you particular significance and value. Now, the Bible says that this special and defining relationship has been damaged by sin, but it can be restored and renewed through faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So Jesus came and lived and died and rose again in order to reconcile you to God. He came to restore that which had been damaged and defaced by sin. He came to heal the breach and to bring us back to God. And that's where salvation ends. You know, we draw out the five G's of the gospel, and I hope you don't miss the shape of that. Because the gospel ends with you back where you were created and intended to be, with God, enjoying Him, glorifying Him forever. That's the gospel. If you are in Christ, then you will be with God, enjoying Him forever. That's the story of your value to God, the God who loved you from before the foundation of the world, who loved you enough to come for you and return you to His presence. He did that for you. And by the way, that's you singular irrespective of your spouse or children or your parents. In fact, Jesus says that this may separate you from your wife, your husband, your kids, or your parents. Jesus said that. He said, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus says, this is a rescue mission, right? I have come to grab hold of you and to lift you up out of your brokenness to restore you and to bring you back where you were created and now saved to be. And if you can't let go of these other lesser relationships in order to hold on to me, then you aren't worthy of what I am doing for you. Do you see that? Your ultimate reality, your ultimate relationship is with God through Christ. And when you have that, you need nothing else. But that doesn't mean that God won't give you anything else. He may or he may not. He may give you a husband and children. He may give you a wife or he may not. All are gifts given at his discretion. But in not giving you those things, should he not give you those things, he may highlight in your life the primary blessing of a restored relationship with him. So here's the point, brothers and sisters. When people see your single, celibate, satisfied life, they will realize that you have been given the pearl of great price, that you have it all, and that you need nothing. Joyful singleness, satisfied celibacy might just be the way that God chooses to rebuke and convict and call and convert a sick 
and sex-obsessed world. Do you understand that? Now listen, we disagree with the Catholics on a great many things. But I remember a number of years ago when I was wrestling my way through this issue and trying to understand it, and I was trying to probe into the Catholic perspective, which I think is wrong, right? First Timothy 3.1 says that an elder, pastor, or bishop should be a husband of one wife. I come from a generation where if you have a verse, you win the argument. So should pastors be married? I don't know. First Timothy 3.1 says yes, so I'm going with yes. Nevertheless, I found it interesting when, the, uh, when Pope John Paul II, a number of years ago, was asked to defend the church's position on a celibate priesthood, which, by the way, they don't elevate to the level of a doctrine, meaning it could at some point change, um, but it is their settled practice. He said, what, you know, he didn't address the theology because, I mean, what do you do when there's a verse telling you that what you're doing is wrong? So wisely, he didn't go into the Bible and say, you know, here's the verse because that's not going to be helpful for him. But, but here's what he said, which I think is actually interesting. He, he said, what better testimony could there be to a sex-obsessed world than a happy celibate priesthood? Now, I... I like I said, I disagree with the application of that concept. But I would say this. I, I would take what he said, and I would just replant it into the priesthood of all believers. Okay? And I would say this. What better testimony could there be to a sex-obsessed culture than single and satisfied priests, as in the priesthood of all believers, men and women, who are saved and satisfied in Jesus Christ? I actually cannot think of anything that would be more likely to attract attention and confusion among our unsaved friends and neighbors than that. Now, lastly and finally, I want to end by asking a very important question. How can the church serve and support single and celibate people? Let me just very quickly suggest four ways. First of all, by being a family, not just a collection of families. When one of the disciples told Jesus that, that he had lost everything in order to follow him, Jesus said this, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. Have you ever read that carefully? Because again, like I said, we often read the Bible through our cultural lens, and, and very often North American Christians, North American evangelicals in particular, have boiled down the benefits of getting saved. They've boiled it down to one thing. I got a ticket sewn in my underwear so that when I die or Jesus comes, I go to heaven. That's it, right? That's the benefit. The benefit is all future doesn't make my life now any better. In fact, it might make it worse. But I got this ticket shown in my underwear so that when God comes, I'm good to go. And so we, we read passages like this, and we miss the now. What does Jesus promise now? He promises right now, in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution, so it's not all going to be rosy, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus doesn't just promise eternal blessings. He does. But he also promises present blessings. And chief among those blessings is 100 houses open to you. 100 brothers and sisters befriending you. 100 mothers mothering you. Now, where else can you find that but in the church? Brothers and sisters, we need to do more than bring our families to church. We need to make our families the church. Older women, is there some young person that you could gather under your wing? Is, is, is there a, a single person that you could, you could wrap in and fold into your Thanksgiving dinner this weekend? They will need that. It's not good for a man or a woman to be alone. 
Secondly, we can help single and celibate people by maintaining a standard. We've been using the word celibacy a lot. Uh, celibacy is kind of an old Christian word, but I like it, so we're going to use it. Uh, celibacy is a word with a long history. It means chaste, pure, single living. Because I want to be clear, our call this morning has not been for the church to embrace single people who have embraced a lifestyle of casual sexual encounters. Okay? No. That's what the Bible calls fornication, and it is forbidden. Singleness in a Christian context means abstinence. It means not having sex. The only blessed sex in the Bible is the sex between a husband and a wife. Everything else is immoral. It is outside. Everything else is destructive. So let's be clear. Sex with other singles is called fornication. Sex with prostitutes is called fornication. Sex with another married person, not your spouse, is called adultery. All of those things are outside the boundaries of blessed sexuality. Now that's our standard. It's repeated by Jesus. It's repeated and affirmed by the Apostle Paul. That's our standard, Old Testament and New. And we do celibate people no favors when we obscure or lower that standard as if they're not capable of living celibate lifestyles by the grace and help of God. Gina D'Alfonso, a single Christian lady who writes about living as a single Christian lady, says in her book, One by One. She says, when the whole world seems to be obsessed with sex, and believe me, when you're not having sex, that is something you're very much aware of. The church of God gives us something the world can't. Those teachings and expectations remind us that we don't have to be obsessed with sex. And in a paradoxical way, they set us free. They help us stay off the crazy, broken merry-go-round of hookups and one-night stands and relationships with no real depth or foundation. Additionally, it offers us a place where that approach is seen as good and right, not freakish and weird. And that just might be the most valuable aspect of all. It's not a kindness to single and celibate people to lower the bar on human sexuality. Kindness is telling the truth of God and offering the love of God to those who are called to live the single and celibate lifestyle. Thirdly, we can support these folks by elevating friendship. Marriage is not the only form of intimate friendship that is commended in the Bible. When David heard about his best friend Jonathan falling in battle, he said, your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now, I'm not sure if it's a good idea for a married man to say that about his best friend, uh, particularly if your wife is listening. <laughs> David's wife was not there, so I guess he felt liberty to say that. But the point is, that the Bible celebrates the reality and the depth of non-sexual, same-gendered friendship. Now, we used to speak about this a lot more. This used to be a major theme in Christian writing. C.S. Lewis talked about this at length. C.S. Lewis only got married late in his life. And, and early in his life, he wrote an awful lot about the benefits and the beauty of non-sexual, same-gendered friendships. J.R.R. R. Tolkien used to write a lot. In fact, The Lord of the Rings is ultimately a story about friendship, and the power of friendship to overcome the darkness of the world. G.K. Chesterton used to write a lot about friendship. We still have examples of godly single men, godly single women who served on the mission field, those stories should be celebrated, and the aspect that friendship plays in those stories should be highlighted for people who are considering that calling. We used to talk a lot more about that in the church, and we need to do that again. Fourthly and lastly, we can support single and celibate people by being faithful and consistent in our community. 
Gina Delfonso, I'm going to quote her again, because to be perfectly honest, I got married young, you know? Part of the problem as a pastor is from time to time, you're called to preach on things you have no personal experience with. And I got married young, and, and I have always enjoyed being married. And, uh, and I never, there was never, I don't know if there was ever four seconds when I considered, you know, the single and celibate lifestyle and calling in my life. And so when I started thinking about, well, how then do I give some guidance and, and some direction to our church as to how we can make space and celebrate and empower folks like this in our community? I have no personal experience to draw on. So I went out and I bought a book written by a lady who's thought a great deal about that. I'd commend it to you. It's called One by One. And all these points of application are actually borrowed from her book. She's thought a lot about this. And she said something that struck me as so interesting. She said that in her conversations, because obviously in writing a book like this and in having a ministry like this, she talks to a lot of single people. She says, in her experience, the main reason that single and celibate people in the church get dragged and sucked into inappropriate sexual relationships is not lust. I mean, she said that's obviously a factor. But in her experience, the main factor is fear. She said it's fear the simple fear of growing old alone and dying old alone. And I'm sure you've heard the old aphorism, you know, the old saying that men will fake intimacy to get sex and sometimes women will fake sex to get intimacy. And a lot of single people end up abandoning the celibate calling not so much out of lust, but as a desire to give something that they think will get something they won't get from the church, which is faithful friendship and support as they age and die. And she said it was interesting. When she fought this battle in her own life, it was observing the care of her father for his widowed male friend that gave her hope in the church. She watched her father drive this friend to all of his medical appointments. She watched him process the pain of of disease and aging and dying. She saw the community of men that gathered around this fellow. And that gave her the strength to trust in the church. I just tell you, this is one of the many reasons. I have a long list, but this is near the top of why I absolutely abhor the concept of targeted church. I grew up in the generation where targeted church was all the rage. In the very first church I worked in, we said unapologetically, we're a church for baby boomers and their kids. Made that very clear. Which, by the way, the seniors heard and understood exactly what it meant. It meant hit the road. And it split the church. The very first church I was a part of split down the middle over our desire to be a targeted church. Everybody was doing it, though. I don't want to blame, you know, as if my leadership at the time were out to lunch. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was told, you can't be everything to all people, right? So pick a demographic and go with it. Let me ask you a question. Who chooses the mentally handicapped demographic as their target audience for a church? Who chooses the poor immigrant demographic as their target audience for a church? And who chooses the incapacitated senior as their target audience for a church? Answer, no one. So over the last 30 years, far too many churches have become far too narrow in their interest and concerns And far too many people have been thrown on the scrap heap of can't do anything for us, therefore have no value. And what this lady is saying is you need to understand that that terrifies people who feel called to the single lifestyle. Because at some point, they may be valuable to you right now because they're young and they've got energy and they can go on your mission trips and they can make your kitchen dinners when, you know, all the guys like me have sick kids and stuff at home and and, uh, they can't make it. So they're useful now. But what happens when they're not useful? Will they still fit into your model? 
you know, that's why I absolutely abhor the concept. That's not that I just don't favor it. Like there's some models of church I don't favor. This one I abhor because I think it's a disgrace to the name of Christ and it's an assault on the very concept of the church. So we need to, we need to do a good job. We got a long way to go. Like we have really blown this one in the last 30 years and we need to reconvince single and celibate people that we will be there for them when they're old and infirm. Let the single and the celibate people in this church see our care for the elderly, for the widow, and let them rest in the life and calling that God has given them. We read about this a couple weeks ago when we're talking about parenting. One of the things we talked about is how the king in Proverbs tells his son to build a rich, multi-layered friendship community. He says this to his son, do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. We can support singles and celibates by building and nurturing a multi-generational community of supportive and faithful friends. Brothers and sisters, let's do this. Let's make this part of our calling. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The quality, the diversity, the breadth, the depth of our community is part and parcel of our witness to the world. So let's do this. Let's build and nurture a winsome and welcoming community that wraps in the widow and the orphan, the single and the celibate for the glory of God and for the good of all people because this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, your ways are right and lead to life. All your gifts are good and we are glad in them. Help us to build and nurture a grateful community around all your many graces to us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.